lots of people online now. Really, really good to see you all. I think it is 2.01, so I'm going to kick off and again say thank you all for joining. Uh, welcome to our Limitless Careers Week, hosted by the Institute of Physics. Uh, and this afternoon's panel on climate change. Uh, we're celebrating National Careers Week uh, in the UK. And these sessions are organized by the Institute of Physics, as I said, as a fantastic opportunity to find out more about the types of careers that physics can and does open up for us all. My name is John Lansley Gordon. Uh, I'm a teacher of physics and maths, and I especially love how the, the fascinating laws of physics can help us understand the natural world around us. And we're going to see a lot of that uh, this afternoon in the variety of people we meet and the careers they tell us about. Uh, I'll be your host, as I said. I'm joined by four fantastic speakers from all over science, uh, and they're their jobs look at ch uh, climate change in all sorts of different ways, really cool ways. Uh, but we all have one thing in common, and that's doing physics. Uh, and that brought us all here together this afternoon. Uh, so we're going to hear from uh, each of them in a moment and have a chat about their exciting uh, careers and the work that they do. Uh, and then it's over to you for your questions. So do make sure that you're keeping a note of your questions um, and send them in uh, over the webinar chat function. Uh, and I'm gonna do my best to keep an eye on those and, and field those when I can. And just as a reminder, if you'd like to use the closed caption feature, this should be at the bottom of your screen, the bottom right, there's a button there if you wish to use the, the caption feature. Um, so this afternoon's speakers, First up, we have Dr. Christine Burmester. Uh, Christine is a physical oceanographer at the Scottish Association for Marine Science in Oban. Give us a wave, Christine. She's investigating how changes in the climate system and in large ocean currents like the Gulf Stream impact each other in the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, she works closely with marine biologists and chemical oceanographers to find out how these changes affect marine ecosystems. Uh, while she's studying, an interesting fact about Dr. Christine, while she's studying the ocean mainly from a computer during her working hours, she explores it firsthand as well uh, by scuba diving in her free time. Uh, so that's Dr. Christine. So after Dr. Christine, we have Alan Simpson. Give us a wave, Alan. Uh, Alan is committed to discovering how research and innovation can help deliver the clean, reliable, affordable en energy that the world needs. He's an experienced nuclear physicist and technician, lead technical lead, sorry, at the UK's National Nuclear Laboratory, leading projects such as working out how much fuel has been used, exploring the potential of the future of nuclear power to generate hydrogen in particular. Uh, outside of work, Alan enjoys traveling to see the world and getting out, walking in the hills near his home. After Alan, we have Naza. Give us a wave, Naza. Naza is a freelance science writer and physics graduate from the University of Leeds. During his time there, he volunteered in the student outreach team uh, and that really gave him his uh, uh, passion for science communication. His articles are always driven by scientific data uh, and he's written about climate tipping points and current climate crisis, the current climate issues we face. Uh, in his free time, Naza enjoys cycling and rock climbing. And finally, uh, last but not least, we have Dr. Jose. Dr. Jose. Jose Louis is a research fellow at the University of Reading, working to improve our understanding of the ways that energy demand is bound up with the rhythm of society and people's day-to-day -day lives. Uh, the models he uses show the way we uh, kind of generate and use electricity and how they are an essential tool to help make the most out of the clean power generated by renewable energy uh, sources. Uh, in his uh, background in, in high energy astrophysics and energy, uh, this led him onto his current role uh, and his spare time is taken up by going on long cycle rides as well and doing a bit of gardening as well. Uh, so I'm shortly going to hand over to Christine to start our session, uh, but please do, as I said, as a reminder, uh, send in your questions on the fly and I'll do my best to, to, to field those when we can. And don't forget to include the speaker name if you want to direct a certain question to one of the speakers um, for that person. So I'm going to, without further ado, hand over to Kristen for our first presentation. Thank you, Jonathan. I'm just waiting until my slides are coming up. I brought a couple of um, pictures uh, from my uh, day to day work. So can we go to the next slide, please? Let's 
So uh, here we are. So uh, as Jonathan already said, I'm a physical oceanographer and I work at the Scottish Association for Marine Science. It's located at the west coast of Oban and uh, you can see my institute here uh, at these slides. And my colleagues and I are investigating climate change uh, with a particular focus on the ocean. And we want to find out how we can adapt to it. And um, if you think about that global warming um, gives excess heat into the climate system and 90% of this heat is taken up by the ocean. So it's actually a very good place uh, to get started um, to find out more about how we can mitigate and adapt uh, to changes associated with it. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? So my career as physical oceanographer didn't start with me worrying about the climate crisis, not at all. You can see me here as a little kid. Um, it was my first holiday uh, at the sea and ever since I love the ocean. And this is actually why I wanted to become a marine scientist. And on the next slide, you can see where I grew up in the middle of Germany. This is labeled uh, here with the number one. And uh, yeah, so I grew up far away of the ocean and actually nobody there could tell me what it is like to be a marine uh, scientist. Uh, the only thing that we knew from TV documentations back then was that I probably need to become a biologist. Only problem, I didn't like biology at all in school. And eventually I dropped the subject. And at the end of my graduation, I was standing there and thinking, I want to become a marine scientist. But can I do that without biology? I was looking for courses about marine physics and couldn't find any in Germany because nobody knew that I actually need to look for physical oceanography. Um, and in the end, because I didn't want to give up, I was uh, going through the university courses uh, from A to Z. And finally, I found physical oceanography and I knew that this is what I want to study. And I applied for it and I got a position in Kiel, which is labeled here with the two. This is how I became a physical oceanographer. And it would have been much, much easier if there was somebody who told me about it earlier. And lucky you, I'm here today and I can tell you a lot about being a physical oceanographer and where you can study it. Um, for example, at SAMS, which is labeled with the three where I'm working now, uh, we have a bachelor in uh, marine science and we also have a physical oceanography and a marine robotics stream in it. But you can also study it for, of course, in Kiel where I study it. So I did my bachelor, my master and my PhD in Kiel um, before I came uh, to open. So how does my day-to-day -day, uh, work life look? like. On the next slide, you see um, a photo from me from a very rare occasion. It was during a cruise uh, last year in October. So I'm doing um, measurements in the ocean. I'm uh, measuring the large scale ocean circulation. However, this is only like once a year. Uh, on the next figure uh, or on the next picture, you see a more common figure of me during work. And this is me sitting in front of the computer trying to get anything out of the data that I measured. Um, and so to give you an overview of what I am actually studying, you see on the next slide, and um, I'm investigating large scale currents in the entire Atlantic. So you can see the Atlantic here. I uh, circled um, the UK in red, and I also put a little boat um, at the location where we had the last uh, research cruise you saw the figure from. And um, yes, these red arrows you see there um, marks ocean currents that are transporting heat from the south of the Atlantic all the way um, towards the north. And this heat is also very important for us here in the UK because um, it um, brings us this warm, humid weather uh, we know very well. <laughs> and living in the UK. And yeah, in, during global warming, these circulation are changing and together with biologists and chemists, I uh, want to find out how they are changing and how they are impacting ecosystems and if they can drive an ecosystem towards a certain tipping point. So an example for this is, for example, the coral bleaching 
um, in the tropic oceans. Um, that would be a, a tipping point. And yeah, I think it's really important um, to share the knowledge from us uh, scientists with everyone. This is also why I started lecturing this year. And uh, I try to implement as much research research as possible into my lectures at SAMS. That's so far for me. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Kristin. That's incredible. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Alan Simpson. Go ahead, Alan. Great. Thanks, Jonathan. And hi, everyone. I uh, hope you're having good afternoons. Um, so, as Jonathan said, I'm Alan Simpson. I'm a nuclear physicist at the National Nuclear Laboratory. Uh, I started out my journey to being a nuclear physicist uh, many years ago when I was lucky enough to go on a school trip. Uh, to Hinkley Point, uh, which is the nuclear power station in Somerset. Uh, and I got inspired by uh, nuclear at that time, but kind of left it and forgot about it. Uh, and I'll come back to how I got back into nuclear a, a bit later. But throughout uh, my teenage uh, years, I knew that I liked technical stuff. I knew I liked problem solving. So I went on to do A-levels in physics and maths and, and further maths. And I remember uh, speaking to my uh, tutor at college uh, and deciding what I wanted to go and do at university. Uh, and uh, uh, I decided in the end to do physics in many ways to put off a decision about what I wanted to do with my life. I wasn't really sure. I knew I liked doing all this technical problem solving stuff, but I thought I'm not really sure. So I'll do physics because it's a really versatile subject. I can go and do lots of different things in the future and make that decision in a few years time. So I did that. I went down to the University of Exeter, had a great time for four years studying physics. Uh, I felt like I made a really good decision when I did that as well as I decided to take a year out doing a placement in research and development in industry. And I discovered when I did that, I really liked the application of physics in industry. You get a really interesting perspective between the pressures of uh, making and scaling uh, solutions to problems up whilst being at the forefront of some of the thinking. Uh, anyway, I got to the end of my university degree uh, and still still not too sure about what I wanted to do with my life. Uh, I decided to take a job with British Airways at the time, uh, working in IT. It was a bit of a, an about turn from, from physics, a bit of a break. Uh, it meant I got to live the, the, the city life, which is something that I hadn't done before because I'd grown up in the, the countryside. Uh, so I had a great time over a couple of years uh, living in London, uh, working British Airways, uh, getting to do some interesting things and, and travel around the world. But I kind of decided that I wanted to find something a bit different, uh, a bit more meaningful uh, for myself and that uh, I enjoyed a bit more to do. So I searched around for other jobs and I came around across these job opportunities from a place called the National Nuclear Laboratory. You may be wondering what the National Nuclear Laboratory is. It, it's a UK government owned organisation that does research and development into nuclear energy and, and nuclear fission. Uh, and the job advert seemed interesting, so I applied and, and gave it a go uh, and was lucky enough to be offered a job at NNL, uh, where I started. Uh, and I joined NNL and I joined uh, the nuclear physics team at NNL. And the nuclear physics team models uh, nuclear reactors to help us understand how the fuel in the, those reactors has been used, which allows us to then build processes to recycle and manage that fuel uh, after it's been inside a reactor. And that's really important because you may not know, but 20% of the UK's uh, electricity is generated by nuclear energy. It's the UK's single biggest source of clean electricity uh, at the moment. And it's really important for keeping our carbon emissions low in the UK. So I joined uh, NNL in the nuclear physics team uh, and get to do some really interesting research and understanding in modelling uh, how a reactor works and all the elements that are created in a reactor. When you operate a nuclear reactor, you create all sorts of different elements from across the periodic table. Uh, and I work with different chemists and chemical engineers and other engineers to understand how we can process and manage that material coming out of the reactor to make sure that it is safely stored and protected and doesn't have any adverse effects on the environment so that we manage and control the whole of the nuclear fuel cycle to best protect the environment. But then the thing that I've been really excited and been doing more and more over the, the past couple of years is I've been getting involved in NL's research on generating hydrogen from nuclear energy. Nuclear energy generates lots and lots of heat, which is really useful for some of the processes that we're looking at as ways to generate hydrogen. Uh, now, what you may not know is about 75% of the energy you, you use in your daily life 
is not consumed as electricity. It's the things like the petrol that goes into your car or the gas that drives your heating in the home. And that's really difficult to decarbonize and reduce our carbon footprint. And so hydrogen is being proposed as a way that we can transfer clean energy uh, around the UK using things like the existing gas grid or uh, pumping it into a cars with hydrogen fuel cells uh, to power our future clean uh, economy. Uh, but generating it at scale is really difficult. Normally, we break down natural gas to do that. And obviously, that still releases lots of carbon dioxide. So I'm getting to do some research now and look at how we optimise nuclear systems in the future to generate lots and lots of clean hydrogen so that we can reduce the amount of uh, CO2 released in the atmosphere uh, and generate enough energy that we can continue living prosperous lives and, and build more prosperous lives for everyone around the world. Thanks so much, Alan. Uh, I'm going to hand over swiftly to Nazar. Next. Thank you for the introduction. So I started off. Right. So I started off my uh, sort of career in physics in by first of all studying physics at the uh, Uni of Leeds. Um, I, I volunteered as like an outreach ambassador while, while I was actually doing my degree. So this was great because I was able to engage the community on actually like scientific topics on by usually going to schools and running like multimedia presentations and, you know, experimental workshops. After my degree, after my degree, I decided actually I, I kind of wanted to follow along in that science communication path. So I became a media at the science gallery. So a media is someone that talks to the people about the, you know, about the art and things like that. But the art was all scientifically inspired. So it meant that I was able to, one, learn great new techniques in engaging like the public, as well as like learn a lot more about different types of like science, science and how different types of art is actually used in communicating to people. So during the pandemic, I've decided actually I wanted to go back to one of my favorite topics in uni, in uni which was my dissertation. So my dissertation, which was on the physics of climate change, was um, specifically on like climate systems and how the greenhouse effects works on them. And so I really felt like I one wanted to start writing articles about that. And so I've been really, I've I've also been working on sort of data analytics and processing data. So I felt like I can combine these two like passions of mine and actually create you know really good um, like articles on that to communicate the you know the problems with climate change. I feel like the challenge behind this is uh, communicating complex ideas quite simply. And so one, that helps to change views. So the story of climate change at the moment is obviously really important. You know, looking at 2018, where there were like extreme heat waves, extreme hurricanes and tornadoes all around the world. So we need to, re we need to reduce emissions now, obviously, because you know, that causes less damage for future generations because of how the greenhouse effect works. There's such a large delay in, in the greenhouse effect. You know, the emissions which we emit today is actually going to be you know, felt in 10 to 20 years. And so with climate change, there are many interconnected features. And these interconnected features are also known, are largely known as feedback effects. So these feedback effects often lead to like an uncertainty in climate systems and kind of make it hard to communicate exactly what's going on. And so the narrative behind climate change becomes really important to change views. And so with COVID-19, that's obviously shown, showed us that actually there's such a, the government has such a large impact on people's lives and they can decide exactly how we, how we go about things, as well as the people's goals or the public's uh, view on the goals, as well as the actual goals are largely disconnected. And so this is where journalists come into play, where they're able to ferry the ideas the actual goals for from like climate reports to the public. However, sometimes journalists often uh, sort of sensationalize um, sort of their articles or nitpick at certain facts, which I know either exaggerate or this is usually to kind of make the article more interesting. And so this is where sort of my job comes into play, where you know clear and concise science writing is 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 a brilliant way in actually letting people know exactly what is going on with the climate. And so, you know, reduce, I feel like the urgency with actually um, reducing emissions and actually, which is, is what uh, motivates me to get out of bed and actually uh, write my silver articles. Thank you very much for listening to me.
Thank you, Naza. Uh, and finally, Dr. Jose. Hand over to you now. Uh, hi, gentlemen. Uh, yeah, thanks for the introduction. Um, well, um, since I was very little, I would often find myself wondering why is it that the world works the way it works? Um, why is it that if I throw, say, this ball at the wall, it bounces off? And why is it that no matter how hard I jump, I can never reach the ceiling? Why is it that I hear someone's voice coming off that old looking music box in the corner? And for this last question, I actually had a, a theory. And my theory was that there were uh, tiny people living inside the box. Uh, such was my curiosity that one day, my mom came back to uh, came back home only to find out that her beloved radio had been taken apart by me. And sadly, the tiny people were nowhere to be found. Uh, anyhow, <laughs> then I went to school and started learning more and more things, including uh, this weird subject called physics. And the more I learned about physics, the more I realized that physics was a way for me to find the answers to many of those questions that I've been asking myself and others since I was a kid. And so I went on to uh, read for a degree in physics where I had the chance to learn even more about the laws that govern our world and the universe. Uh, but the best thing about studying physics is that uh, you don't just learn a bunch of laws. Um, you learn a whole new language for describing what's happening around you and you learn a whole new way of thinking that allows you to formulate theories that can help you solve almost any problem you face. Uh, so towards the end of my degree, when uh, the time to do my final project came, I had the opportunity to work in the astrophysics department at my uni, studying something called um, gamma ray bursts, uh, which are the result of uh, the most violent and spectacular events in the universe, like when a star collapses into itself and a supernova explosion occurs, or when two black holes collide and merge into one. And as fascinating as I thought these things were, I couldn't help but thinking that perhaps there were some more pressing issues and closer to my own world as well that I could help tackle, such as the climate crisis we're facing. So. I went on to do a PhD in uh, energy research, which is a fairly broad field of study uh, with people from lots of different backgrounds, including physics like myself, and with the overall aim of making possible the transition towards a world where renewable energy sources are our primary energy sources and virtually zero greenhouse gases are released into the atmosphere. And to this day, I'm still working on this field as a university researcher. And while the kind of things I do nowadays are not what you learn in your typical physics lesson, I am able to do them partly because of all the skills that I acquired during my physics degree. Some of these things are more related to physics than others. For instance, when I look at the amount of energy that's required to keep our homes warm over the winter months, or how much energy is lost when we convert uh, for instance, electricity into light. Uh, but for some others, uh, I, um, I require more some of the other uh, things I learned, like the maths or computing skills. Uh, for instance, when I create computer models that simulate the way we use energy in our everyday lives and calculate how much energy we need based on the kind of things we normally do on, say, a Monday afternoon. And all of these things are very exciting to me. And uh, it is really motivating to think that perhaps some of these things I've found during my research will help us use less energy overall and make a more efficient use of our renewable energy sources in the future. Um, thanks. Thank you again. Thank you, uh, Dr. Jose, and to all my speakers for 
uh, their, their introductions there. Uh, and I'd like to remind you all in the audience to continue sending in your amazing questions. We've got a good few so far. Um, I'm going to fire some questions that I've, I've jotted down uh, for our speakers, but please do keep sending those in uh, for me because we're going to go into a Q&A session in about 15 minutes or so. So keep sending in uh, some great questions and don't forget to refer to the speaker if you have a specific question for any of us. Uh, so thank you all again. Um, I'd like to, uh, I suppose, start off with a question to Dr. Kristin, actually. Um, uh, you mentioned that uh, you, you, you work in marine science. And as a student myself, I would never have thought that physics could lead to a job in, in marine science, you know, working with, with the ocean. When I was at school, physics was just all about wires and connecting circuits and voltage and current over and over again. How does physics, how did physics lead you to, to that? Because I would never have thought that those two things are, are linked. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't, I, for me, it was the same, actually. For me, um, I really needed to find out by myself because I just thought like, okay, I want to become a marine scientist, and uh, but I don't have biology as subject anymore. So I have physics and chemistry and math. So I need to work with that. And um, in general, what we learn in physics is about forces and how they can impact uh, bodies. And at the same, uh, what is happening in our climate change. So for example, um, we learned that the moon has a gravitation and that the earth has a gravitation. And uh, because the moon is circling around the earth, we got the tides. And it's um, physics, right? And the tides are impacting the ocean mm. uh, and we just can explore them like this. And that's a lot of these forces that is actually um, um, happening in the ocean. So they are physical forces. When we have a current, it's physics. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, this is, so at some point uh, it was clear that it was there and I was just, yeah, reading through university courses and find out there is physical mm. oceanographer and this is when I started to study it. It's, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's the flexibility, isn't it? And, and you touched on a really important point there is that a lot of the time we think we may be missing something or we're not quite, you know, the, the, there's an aspect of us that isn't quite ready to do something like physics. But actually, physics is so flexible that it opens up routes we never even thought of into, into different careers. Um, I'm going to go to, thanks for that, uh, Dr. Chris. I'm going to go to NASA next. Um, I've got a really quirky question here. Um, mm -hmm. There are people that think, believe it or not, that the earth is flat. Yeah. Despite overwhelming evidence from, from physics and science that suggests otherwise, yeah? Um, oh, there, yeah. Are also, there are also lots of people that don't believe that climate change is really a thing. They don't, you know, even governments and politicians, will, you, you hear this on the news and say, cast doubt on on the kind of overwhelming scientific evidence that suggests that our climate is changing and irreversibly at that. Um, so my question to you as a, as a science communicator uh, is, is um, how, how important is using data and numbers when communicating the effects of climate change? You touched on this, but how important is it to have that, that, that data backing in your work and generally as well? Well, I feel like it's, it's, it's so important because then you're able to really show people exactly, for example, on graphs, like what is going on, because people, once they see like data, I feel like they're automatically like, okay, yeah, this must be true almost like words and words, words are important. And you mm. know, that, that narrative is also important to, to say like, you know, that this is a doomsday effect and we're, we're, we're heading for this, but then, you know, people need to see the numbers and the data and, as well as once you actually on, on a graph, it's a lot easier to then explain, like, for example, this is the temperature change and this is, this is where we're heading to. And this is where we actually need to, this is where we need to stop. Mm -hmm. And when people kind of get a, almost a, a visualized version of what is going on, they're able to really um, understand like, and actually yeah, see that. Yeah, yeah. 
So you, you, I mean, you, know schools, you mentioned graphs because um, I remember being in school and, and, and as a teacher myself, you know, I'm banging home all the time, the importance of graphs and, and, and data. I think it's also important if you agree, you know, as physicists, we, we have not only the ability to collect the data and make the measurements, but also to interpret it. So to be able to understand what those things are telling us. And uh, that is often a, a really important skill. And as a science communicator, I think it's your role to be able to tell that narrative, as you touched on, mm. uh, which is so important to, to convince people that these effects are real. And there are huge implications for all of us, regardless of our field or where we are on the planet. There are huge implications that really make me mean that we're all in the same boat together. Exactly. Um, that, that, that's a really important point. Um, Alan, thanks again. Um, you're, you're a nuclear scientist. Uh, I think of uh, Homer Simpson working at the, the nuclear power plant with the radioactive uranium, the green rod and the big helmet when I think of a nuclear scientist in a, in a nuclear reactor. Um, so uh, my question to you is, is there something that you know now that you wish you as a 14 year old self, I'm guessing who would have been watching The Simpsons as well. Uh, is there something that you know now about being a nuclear scientist that you, you, you would have known as a, as a 14 year old that you wish you could tell yourself back then? What would it be? Um, I think the thing that I took a long time to realise, and it wasn't until I started working in the nuclear industry, uh, is uh, how good it is for the planet in terms of all that CO2 that's avoided. Mm. Uh, one of the, the facts I love most about the nuclear industry is you can calculate the number of like deaths avoided from the CO2 that's been avoided mm. being uh, emitted into the atmosphere. Uh, and I think had I known that at 14, uh, the green liquid uh, that we see on The Simpsons, uh, and it isn't green liquid, by the way, it's, uh, it's much duller than, than the green liquid flowing. <laughs> uh, would have been uh, less concerning because I'd have realised the overwhelmingly nuclear power is really good for reducing the, the, the deaths. Uh, and then uh, to just the, the so many different aspects uh, of nuclear energy that, that go together. And it's a real team effort to, to make these reactors, reactors work. Uh, there's something like a thousand people that work at a nuclear reactor just to keep it running uh, every day. And all those different skills and, and uh, abilities coming together to, to make these, these machines work uh, day in, day out, uh, is, it's, a, it's an amazing team effort, which I really enjoy being part of. Yeah, it's super collaborative. Um, and you also touched on a, a really nice link there is, again, that, that kind of um, almost distance between what we think we learn in school, which is a very abstract things about how atoms work, protons, neutrons, electrons. And I would never have thought, and it's really great to hear you say that, that there is a, there is a direct link between understanding those things and having an impact on, on, on real life, such as, you know, it, it kind down the deaths because of pollution and, and decarbonizing the, the kind of atmosphere. So I think that's a really interesting link you touched on there. And just keeping with the, the kind of school theme that we have going, uh, Dr. Jose, you mentioned a typical physics lesson and that, that resonated with me because I'm a physics teacher and I was like, oh my God, I, I, I think of my lessons and I hope they're really interesting, really engaging. Um, and a challenge I always get from my students is, yeah, but what is the significance? What is the relevance of this to, to, to real life? You know? um, so I wanted to, to kind of touch on a point you, you brought up again about your, your typical physics lessons and what you're learning and why, why the, the, the things we learn, even though they're, they're very distant to things we perhaps see on the news about, I think you mentioned gamma ray bursts and black holes colliding and things. Why is it so important to understand the, the fundamentals um, and, and then uh, using those further down the line. What, what, what's the significance of the fundamentals? Uh, well, physics is uh, everywhere around us. Everywhere you look, there's some application of physics. Uh, the fact that we can simply jump on a plane and land in a different continent, uh, it's something that uh, still amazes me. And we can only do that because of that uh, sort of uh, knowledge of the fundamentals of physics, how things work, why the things uh, uh, are the way they are. And the, in the case of uh, the study of the universe and black holes and uh, um, gamma ray bursts and that sort of thing, we can use uh, those kind of events to learn more about 
the origin of the universe itself, because that's the closest thing that we have to studying what happened at the beginning of the universe. And also we get to learn a lot of uh, things about the past of, of the, the universe as well, because the kind of uh, measurements that we make are not from something that's happening in real time. It's something that happened billions of years ago and we're just picking up the signal now. So we can have some sort of peek into the past, mm. so, uh, so to speak, right? So we, we, we get to- like, to like looking back in time. To back in time, yeah, exactly. Yeah. We get to look back in time and learn about all those things that had to happen so that we can be here today talking about physics. Totally agree. Um, I'd like to uh, reflect a question now to the floor. So anyone can jump in and answer this one. Uh, I really like this question. Uh, doing science can take you all over the world because it's an international discipline. It opens up the whole planet. Um, so my question is, what is the most exciting place that you've been to as scientists and as physicists? That's open to anyone. So please jump in. Need a few, sec few seconds to think about it. Go ahead, Alan, go ahead. Uh, it's a bit closer to home for me. Uh, uh, I actually work on this site. It's the Sellafield site in, in West Cumbria, uh, and I find it fascinating. Uh, it contains the whole history of the UK's nuclear capability, uh, and you can walk around the site in maybe half an hour, and within that time, you can see tens of years of scientific research and progress from some of the earliest installations to some of the latest technology that we're deploying. Uh, and I find that really exciting to be able to, to go to that site uh, every day and, and be in that environment. Amazing. I always forget how, you know, the UK, we're at the cutting edge of, of, of nuclear research and history. It's just amazing that this is on our doorsteps. That's incredible. Uh, anybody else? Yeah, Dr. Christine. Yeah, for me, it's a, a little bit harder to reach. So it's actually the Atlantic Ocean. So um, you, because for me, it's when I'm studying a certain research area, I just have it on my computer. And then I got like once a year, I got the chance to actually get out there. And when I looking into ocean currents, I am there and our boat is fighting the currents and you can you notice how strong it is. And like these kind of real experiences, what connects the theory with the real world, this is the most exciting places actually for me. I remember studying lightning in atmospheric physics at university um, and, and connecting the theory to the real experience is, is a really strange uh, to, to, to go through, isn't it? To kind of be like, not only am I experiencing, I understand what's happening, really interesting. Uh, Dr. Jose or, or, or Naza? Uh, sure. So uh, around the time of my research placement with the astrophysics department at my uni, uh, some of the people working there were involved in the construction of uh, a kind of telescope for uh, studying precisely the, the kind of things that I was researching, the gamma ray bursts. But it's not the typical thing that comes to mind when you think about a telescope, right? So to, in order to uh, study these things, you need to have a lot of uh, detectors spread over a very large area. And the best way to do that is uh, to put them on the highest point that you can find. So I got the opportunity to go to the uh, location where they were building this observatory and get to learn that telescopes are not only these sort of large, uh, long tubes with lenses at the ends, but also can be uh, arrays of different uh, instruments that can um, reconstruct the signal that we get from outer space into something that we can then read on a computer monitor and uh, analyze. It's incredible stuff, it's incredible stuff. Um, I've seen myself some of the images of these. I think one of them is called the Very Large Array. 
I think that's in Mexico of, of, of a spread of telescopes, you know, covering a huge area is, is incredible work. Um, and it links to my next question, again, open to the floor. And then I'm going to start a, a, as a reminder to our audience, I'm going to start dipping into our Q&A box. So please do now dive in there and, and ask some questions, either generally or specific ones to any of our speakers. I'm going to start dipping in uh, for some cool questions. Um, but one of this, again, uh, one of the, the, the themes we've been talking about is uh, computers and uh, how computing is now impacting our work uh, and the first question around computing is from our audience and it's about AI in particular how has computing and AI started to impact the work that you've been doing and have you seen that become more of a, uh, a thing really in your areas of, of work and that's open again to the, to the floor um, yeah so I've been using machine learning to actually kind of find a trend of how the temperature change is going to, you know, change uh, with, with our greenhouse emissions. So whether you're able to understand, like, for example, by 2100, uh, you know, the pre-industrial temperature change is going to be maybe three degrees or four degrees. Mm. That's obviously very important in understanding how things are going to change with, with in, in the future. So physicists have to use these computer models which take in all of that data and all of that information and then predict the changes that happen. And that gives us our basis to kind of say, this is going to happen by such and such. And therefore we need to act in this way to stop that happening. Really interesting point there. Uh, exactly. Anybody else on uh, computing and artificial intelligence? Really interesting cutting edge stuff. Go ahead, Dr. Kristen. So yeah, also for uh, my research, it's really important because um, like our observations of the oceans, they are limited. And often we go there and have like one tiny point uh, for um, uh, that needs to represent a large part of the ocean. So we need um, models on computer-based calculations to yeah, get uh, to put it into bigger focus. And um, the um, artificial intelligence is uh, really helping in making our work easier because uh, um, you don't need to control each step of what it is doing, but you can teach the algorithm actually to do some of these steps mm. for you. So it's uh, quite important. Mm. And, and, and a similar theme around the, the computing question is how the pandemic has affected your, your world of work. Now, clearly we're all uh, at home or in our office somewhere separated and we're, we're all used to the Zoom conference style interaction. How has it impacted what you're actually doing day to day in, in your jobs? Go ahead, Alan. Well, uh, sticking with the, the computing theme, uh, for me, uh, I've been really lucky. A lot of what we do to support uh, nuke reactors is uh, computational modeling. So we're, we're working on our computers to make all these models all the time. Uh, and something that's quite interesting in, in the work we do is we're working on models that were maybe developed 40, 50 years ago sometimes uh, and have been kept up to date with the, the lifetime of the reactor. So uh, we're still working on some of these uh, older models, but also then applying uh, from the question before uh, things like uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning to help us uh, pick through the data that supports the inputs to these models. So we use lots of experiments to take measurements to, to input to these models and looking at how we can use machine learning to more efficiently pick through that and select the right data so that we can model as, as well as possible. But in terms of our day-to-day -day work, it's meant that we can do lots more remotely. Uh, and the better we, we know, the better that we do that, uh, and the more computation we use, the more flexible we'll be able to be in the future and need to spend less time uh, working on sites. Mm. And just uh, coming back to you there, Alan, I've got a question from uh, one of our audience members. Uh, something I think we all want to ask, but perhaps are too shy to ask it. I was too shy. So I'm really glad it's been posed here. How dangerous is your job? as a nuclear scientist is it dangerous it's it's not dangerous at all it's very very safe uh so uh we have lots of monitoring and safety around nuclear installations and lots of different rules and regulations around what we can and can't do uh, so there's lots and lots of safety features uh, around what we're doing to, to to keep us safe for example something that as a nuclear scientist working in what are called active areas where we have some of these radiation generating uh, materials uh, we have little monitor tags that we'll wear all the time 
and they'll monitor how much dose we take up. Uh, and the average dose that any of us will, will take up on that site in a year uh, is less than you'd get flying a couple of times back and forth uh, over the Atlantic in a year. Or maybe if you got an X-ray on your chest, you would get more radiation dose than from working on a nuclear licensed site. So it's really well monitored and controlled and safe. And a lot of the, the work of the, the physicists and scientists operating the facilities is to do all these computational models so that we can understand how the system's going to work uh, before we run it. So we've got a really good understanding of, for example, the reactor that's being built in Somerset, Hinkley Point, mm. will have been modelled thousands and thousands of times in different permutations, different ways, so that we've got an, an intricate understanding of how it will operate in all those different ways. So we can be really, really sure that it's going to be safe uh, and protect all of those people around it whilst it's operating. Mm -hmm. Great response. Uh, and again, thank you all. There are loads of questions coming in now. Uh, so I'll do my best to get through uh, as many of them as I can. And this question, I think, is for NASA. Uh, really cool question here. Uh, and again, back to the theme of climate change. Uh, what is a climate tipping point uh, and how close are we, if at all, to any of them? Uh, so what are those? Go ahead, NASA. Uh, so a climate tipping point is, so there's certain like uh, climate systems around the Earth that are you know, allow the climate to exist how they are. So for example, one would be the permafrost in uh, near Greenland, I believe. And so a trapped underneath the permafrost is a lot of like carbon dioxide, uh, about 4,000 times the amount in the actual atmosphere. And so with the, with the earth warming up, that's kind of defrosting that permafrost. And so the carbon dioxide, which is trapped in the permafrost is being released into the, into the atmosphere. The problem is, is that usually this is kind of irreversible, and so it means it means that actually once that once once that climate tipping point has tipped, all, all the the all the carbon dioxide will be released into the atmosphere and heat the earth up even more. However, underneath that carbon dioxide is like methyl hydrates, which are actually so once the methane gets released into the atmosphere, that's that's about that's even worse because methane has about eight times as much um, the amount of effects on the greenhouse effect as uh, carbon dioxide. And, uh, and, and again, it's, it's that irreversibility, isn't it? It's the, the kind of, the, 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 the heart of the tipping point is that the implication once we pass, you know, there's no turning back. Exactly. Uh, what makes it so important for people to not only know, but also to understand, you know? Uh, and I, I've got a question here for Dr. Jose. Um, it was mentioned earlier in, in, in one of the introductions about a carbon footprint. Um, and I wondered what that was and, and why it's important because we hear about these kind of global effects of climate change and it makes us on an individual basis feel that it's separate from us and we can't really have an impact on something that's so uh, global. So what can we do as, as individuals, as kids, as, as adults, what could we do to, to help change uh, uh, the effects of climate change and uh, does a carbon footprint have anything to do with that? Or oh, Dr. Jose? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, the carbon fr uh, footprint, uh, uh, it's, it's basically um, all that uh, results in, in, in carbon emissions or greenhouse gas uh, emissions uh, from the things that we do in our everyday lives. And some of those things relate to the kind of things that I'm studying, like the way we use energy and the amount of energy that we use. But some others are uh, uh, also related to some things that might not be necessarily directly connected with the supply of energy, like gas or electricity, for instance, uh, the way the food is produced and other uh, sources of emissions like uh, well, the methane that comes out of the cow's bumps. <laughs> so when you put all of that together, you can get like an estimate of more or less how much carbon emissions or greenhouse gas emissions can be um, associated with certain lifestyles. So all of those things that contribute towards that carbon emission can be uh, 
change to some degree uh, so that we uh, emit less. So that we, we can, if in effect, have, have an impact, our own impact. Uh, in, in, in particular, if we all do a, a small change, it, it adds up, doesn't it? It adds up to have an impact uh, uh, globally. So uh, thanks for that, Dr. Jose. This question is for Dr. Christine, uh, and I think it's quite a cool one. What is the most unusual discovery that you've ever come across? The oceans are huge. Um, yeah, that's true. I think, um, so with respect to my research, the un most unusual discovery is actually about a smaller feature, which is still quite big and um, it's called an eddy. And um, so it's like a circulation motion of water masses in the ocean. You can find them everywhere. And um, they are around, yeah, one to two kilometers uh, big. So it's actually not too big when you look at the ocean in, entirely. And there are special kinds of um, these eddies where you have no oxygen in the water column and small animals um, can be trapped in these eddies because they are circulating so fast and they cannot escape. And they actually are dying there. Uh, which is uh, quite sadly, but um, yeah, this is uh, one of the most unusual and uh, still quite interesting feature that I discovered during. Super uh, cool. It's so cool. And one of the, the amazing facts I only recently understood and, and found out was that I think we know more about uh, our solar system than we do about the, the, the kind of depths of the ocean on our own planet. And to me, that just blew my mind, like how much out there is there to, to still discover and to understand. And obviously science and physics is, is a route to, to doing that. Um, and, and my enthusiasm for these things, usually uh, uh, it, it kind of holds me up to this question that I'm about to pose to the floor, um, which would be really interesting to hear your responses. Um, and someone from our audience has asked, have you ever experienced being called a nerd just because of what you study? And if so, how did that make you feel? And why should we um, promote being passionate about what we are passionate about and in particular physics? And that's open to the floor. Uh yeah, definitely. But then, you know, it's, it's, it's the word, isn't it? Like if it if it empowers you, if you like physics, that means being a nerd can only be a good thing now. Mm. Anybody else? I think an important question. Uh, I, I was definitely called a, a nerd for uh, many years at school, uh, and I definitely still am a nerd. Uh, and too. Uh, the difference uh, I find now is uh, I'm so inspired and passionate about what I do uh, is that people are interested to to listen uh, to me uh, and 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 learn. So as as you go through life, it, it changes and people are more interested to, to listen to you rather than than calling you a nerd. So like Naza said, uh, own it. it. It's a great term to be uh, called later on. Absolutely, own it. And and it's such an important point you touched on there about being happy uh, and passionate, and it, and it kind of draws people inwards. Um, and usually the people that are name calling are not happy themselves, you know. Uh, so I've always kind of hung on to the fact that I found it deeply fascinating to, to, to understand how the universe works. We've got loads of questions in the audience that tells me the same. You know, we've got questions about is there intelligent alien life out there? And Dr. Jose was talking about telescopes and things. So I think it's so important to find what you, you, you think is passionate about and be able to communicate it, which is why we're all here today. Um, I've got another question to the floor that I think is a really important one. Uh, so well done to, to whoever uh, posted this one in the Q&A box. And they asked, do you think uh, if we continue with the Paris Agreement, we will be able to reverse the impacts of climate change? So I think it would be useful if anyone's happy to answer this question to give us a quick summary of what the Paris Agreement is. Uh, and then do you think if we're able to meet those and, can, and move it forward, will we be able to reverse uh, the, the impacts of climate change? Are we still in the, the zone whereby that's possible? And that's open to the floor again. So I know the Paris Agreement was uh, signed by 197 countries in 2015. And it's an agreement to kind of keep the pre-industrial temperature, temperature change below two degrees. 
And so this is like the, this temperature change is kind of like this metric for climate change. And so if we keep it below two degrees, where that kind of ensures that the climate systems won't be too out of whack in, in the future. But are we, we're, we're not actually at the moment in kind of, we're not, we're probably not going to meet it unless we kind of reduce emissions more. And, and act very, and act very quickly as, as such. Exactly. Uh, I, I'm going to, in our last five minutes, answer as many from the Q&A box as we can. So to Dr. Christine, what inspired you to be a scientist? Um, well, actually, um, I just uh, wanted to study the ocean and uh, I didn't plan to become a scientist uh, when, I, when I started it. It just uh, like I was interested and then I wanted to know more and then it was fun. And um, fun. it's fun. yeah, it's my passion. And um, so it just involves. I think that's a lovely summary. You know, yeah. it, it's the fun, isn't it? Um, I've got a question for Alan here. Uh, what do you think is the future of nuclear fusion? Uh, nuclear fusion is really exciting uh, and they're developing some reactor types uh, at a group called the United Kingdom Atomic Energy Authority uh, near Oxford uh, to look at how to extract uh, energy from fusion. But it's really challenging to make nuclear fusion work. There's, there's lots and lots of challenges with it. So uh, I think there'll be both nuclear fission and nuclear fusion for decades to come. Uh, and we can use both of them to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels. Mm. Thanks for that, Alan. Uh, I'm going to ask this to Dr. Jose, a really a sticky one. So I'm going to challenge you to keep your answer relatively short here. Uh, as a scientist, do you ever lie to the world? I don't think that's posed at you personally, but I think more generally, do scientists ever lie? Um, I think a very important part of being a scientist is to, uh, you know, stick with the science and stick with the facts. So you cannot just go around telling people lies uh, <laughs> because that's just not gonna take us anywhere. <laughs> so I think stinking, sticking to the facts, you know, the facts that are, are, are commonly agreed to be true, whether or not, uh, you know, we, we, what our opinion of them is, I think, I think is the answer there. Um, uh, I'm gonna pose this to uh, NASA. Uh, how hard is your job? How hard is it to communicate science clearly? Um, I think it depends on the audience, you know, and actually if you mm -hmm. connect to the audience, that mm -hmm. means you're able to really communicate to them. But if you don't, then it can be quite difficult. Uh, another question, I suppose to the floor here, one that I think generally our audience will always wonder, does our work pay a decent amount? Is being a scientist lucrative? I could say uh, working in the nuclear industry uh, pays a, a reasonable amount uh, uh, and it's a, it's a well-paid uh, job to work in the nuclear sector for sure. I think, I think yeah, I totally agree there. I think the skills you have as a scientist are so sought after in today's modern society that people will be willing to pay big bucks, especially if you can demonstrate passion uh, in any area you go into, but especially in science and physics. Um, so I think we are just, just about out of time there. Thank you all so much uh, for coming to this session. Uh, I'd like to once again, thank my speakers, Christine Allen, uh, Naza and Jose uh, for their fantastic presentations and for fielding the, the difficult questions and the cool ones we had there. Um, and we hope you found it very interesting. Uh, so to our audience, uh, thank you once more. Uh, before you go, we'd actually be really grateful for your feedback about how you found the session. Uh, so if you scan this uh, QR code that's, that's uh, presented on screen now, uh, or go to the link on the screen, uh, it will take you to a very short survey, so please do let us know what you think about the session. We hope you found it really useful and, and interesting. Uh, and a final note for teachers in the audience as well, thanks so much for supporting the Limitless Careers Week. Uh, we're going to be in touch shortly following this with links to other great resources uh, from the Institute of Physics and recordings of all this week's online events. So thank you once again from me uh, and have a lovely afternoon. We're going to sign off now. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.